what this is? It's a man. Of the 15 carload ship, transfer 12A units to Area 3 and 16... Talking to a machine. ...charges to Area 4. And this is a machine talking to a machine. As a society, we've become used to computer problems of one kind or another, just as we've become used to computers. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. Cellular phones not only are becoming less expensive, they're getting smaller. One piece, handheld. Not car phones, street phones. Tomorrow when the Mall of America opens, there are going to be 270 stores to, to look through. But to, if that weren't enough, there are going to be 400 of them when this is all said and done and completed. Jim Terrorhorse lives in Boulder, Colorado, but he's not in the lumber business. He's a computer programmer for a high-tech California company, Silicon Graphics. And he does his job from his house. Well, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm-hmm. Um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it said. If we are destined to live in a global village, one day we will all be connected to the internet. I turn on my computer. I go online. Welcome. Welcome. And my breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You got mail. company, Amazon.com, Earth's biggest bookstore. You can't drop by, not in person anyway. For the customer, Amazon only exists on the computer screen. There's a better way to rent movies. As many as you want for only $17.99 a month and no late fees. Go to Netflix.com. There's a blockbuster video store on every corner. In recent years, many of them have closed. Boy, it's getting serious. In case you haven't noticed, the U.S. newspapers, they are folding at an alarming rate and... Uh, some people are switching to online only. It's not the internet that's killing the newspaper, it's that newspapers are trying too hard to hold on to a past. Americans love to buy, but getting shoppers into traditional malls and stores is becoming a hard sell. Shopping centers turning into ghost towns as consumers shift to online shopping. Take a moment and remember your favorite teacher. Now imagine that teacher could reach not 30 kids in a classroom, but millions of students all over the world. From reality to virtual reality, in this school in Chengdu, students can fully immerse themselves in the virtual geographical world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ASU President Michael Crow. So what we were trying to do with these uh, catchy videos is give you a sense of exactly this concept, the velocity of change. It's something that's really hard to understand in your personal life. Human beings have never experienced change at the rate that it's being experienced now. And what I mean is that change used to be experienced over multiple generations. You talked to, if you had the, the blessing to uh, meet your great grandparents, they'd tell you stories that were different than the world that you lived in, but not dramatically different. Uh, now uh, we're seeing change that's likely to occur within single generations, fractions of generations within uh, a person's lifetime as a worker or in their career. These are really, really uh, fast things, and you can wish. How many of you wish that it would all slow down? How many? Yeah, too bad. And so uh, it actually doesn't work that way. Uh, we're being empowered uh, by uh, things that are beyond belief. You know, in 1971, the big fancy Intel chip had a few thousand transistors on it. A transistor didn't exist until just before 1950. And today, there are billions of transistors on a single chip. Billions, billions on a single chip. And so this velocity of change is being driven by everything that you can possibly imagine. And so what, what I wanted to try to do today was talk about this journey that we have been on. We're a, a late comer university to the research university game. What I mean by that is we evolved after almost all of the other research universities had already evolved. In 1960, 
Uh, we were just coming out of being only an education college or a teacher's college. We didn't begin any research activity until the 1980s. Uh, other major research universities were already world-class institutions in 1960. None of our competition was not already what they are now by the time we were uh, allowed by public referendum to become a research university. So what I want to do is I want to talk about where we were 30 years ago, 1988, how the university worked, how it operated, what we could achieve, how we achieved it, where we are now, 2018, 30 years later, and uh, I'm not foolhardy enough to predict the future 30 years into the future, but we can make some speculative, informed guesses about where we might be and what the world might look like. So we're going to cover a 60-year time frame. 60 years is uh, not that huge of a piece of time. How many of you are over 60 like me? A few? Yes? Yeah, so Brittany Benedict, our student body president, still finds that hard to believe that there's people at the university that are over 60, but Brittany, it's true. And so um, Buckminster Fuller, who was a mid-20th century architect, designer, dreamer, conceptualizer, said that you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something. You build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Now, welcome to ASU. Welcome to ASU. And I mean that seriously. You cannot derive the kind of change that you want you have to build a new model, a new thing, a new way of working. And I'm going to walk through how some, of that, how some of that works. This is the King's Library. It's actually not the building itself. It's uh, a few thousand books, less than 20,000 books. It's sitting in London, right at the entrance of the British Library. It had a profound effect on me years ago when I saw it for the first time going into the entrance. Built around it is this massive, massive library organization that you can imagine carries with it the history of the British Empire and everything you can possibly imagine. So King George at the time, 1762, every book available on the planet that he could acquire is in that piece of glass. All of the written known knowledge that existed at the time that they could acquire. That's it, the King's Library, 1762. So in the, in the context of time, that was yesterday. Nothing has been the same. We move forward now and we see that knowledge is expanding is evolving, is advancing at such a rapid rate that what used to take a, a hundred years to double knowledge, like 1900, so what we think of as knowledge or information or ways in which we look at things now are doubling every few minutes. So if I can map a cancer genome of a specific cancer, the volume of knowledge and information contained in the models deriving an understanding of that genome of that cancer is an unbelievable expansion of human knowledge and human understanding. So this acceleration that we have is, uh, and the reason for going through these things, it used to be, if we could go back one slide, it used to be that a single person, a, a great intellect like Thomas Jefferson, highly educated for his day, he could know everything there was to know about biology. He could know Greek philosophy. He could know a little bit about, not a little bit, a lot about everything that there was to know. How do you, how do you make that work in this world? Well, you can't give up. You have to come up with new ways of thinking, new ways of learning, new ways of moving forward. And so what I want to walk you through is the absolutely unique opportunity that we have at ASU being a latecomer to the world of research universities in our design and in our configuration. Now, here's the thing. I'm not a big believer that we haven't achieved things that are off scale compared to anything that humans before us have achieved. I'm not a big believer that the past hasn't produced an unbelievable outcome. I'm a believer that all of us are unbelievably privileged to be sitting in this room for all of those things that have come before us and everything that has been achieved. I'm just going to walk you through some of the things that have happened just in the last uh, 30 years. So polio cases have decreased by more than 99% on the planet in the last 30 years. Life expectancy has continued to rise in the last 30 years. Not the last 100 years, the last 30 years. There's one country, by the way, where these numbers are now negative that you happen to know very well. It'd be the one you live in. This is globally. Life expectancy in the United States has gone down for two years in a row, and I'm going to come back and talk about what that means. Global literacy is now nearly 90%. The planet was historically illiterate. All levels, all cultures, all ways illiterate. 
what happens when all humans are literate? All of a sudden, people in places like Saudi Arabia say, you know what? We're going to drive. <laughs> Information just gets around in a different way. People living in extreme poverty has decreased by a billion people since 1988. Thanks to economic development largely in Asia, thanks to free trade alliances, thanks to global trade, global engagement, technological advancement, technological enhancement, everything that you can possibly imagine. And the reason for walking through these points is just to indicate that we're cresting on an unbelievable wave of achievement. We're cresting on an unbelievable wave of human potential just as we enter into an era where these technological changes and technological opportunities will create things that humans sitting in this room right now, all of you, we can barely conceptualize what our children and grandchildren will be able to know and learn and how they might be able to learn and what they might be able to achieve. So this is a funny one that I pulled out of Steven Pinker's recent book on the world, you know, today's the best day in the history of the world. This is a funny one, so let me just walk you through it. So, so it turns out that light, lumen hours, so humans lived in darkness for most of our existence. Darkness. When the sun went down, that was it. Not so good. Oh, yeah. You know, Frank got eaten by the tiger last night. <laughs> Bill and Sally didn't make it back to camp. And so this is the change in, well, how many of you have lived without electricity for longer than a camp out? Not as much fun as having electricity. So imagine light, ubiquitous light, ubiquitous light on the planet, and what does that change? So this is what the calculations are from uh, Our World in Data by Max Roser. 35,000 pounds is estimated to be the cost to produce uh, a billion lumen hours, meaning it was not doable. You couldn't do it with whatever was existing at the time. And since roughly 1900, thanks to uh, Thomas Alva Edison and a range of other people and a range of technological advances, the cost for a billion lumen hours in British pounds to provide ubiquitous light to human beings is almost nothing. OK, well, the next one of these is going to be ubiquitous computing. The next one of these is going to be ubiquitous this, ubiquitous this, ubiquitous that, and they're all going to cost nothing. And then those are going to become the foundational bases on which learning and achievement and human potential and human drive and human ambition Human creativity are all going to be empowered in ways that we have never even fully understood because only small numbers of us have been freed to be as maximally creative as we might be. And so this is just an example of how things, in fact, change. Now, here's a thing that we all ought to be very cognizant of. This is not a casual statement. 65% of all school entering students children entering primary school today will be working in job types, not jobs, job types that do not even exist. Now, none of you in this room believe that. None of you believe it. So who is the person that commands a fleet of drones to carry out? I was talking to a farmer the other day from western Arizona talking to me about his new drone pilot what the drone pilot was working on with his $87,000 Tinker Toy drone that he has that could do about a tenth of what he hoped that the drone could ultimately do. So drone pilot, drone pilot for agricultural assessment, drone pilot for this or this or this. I'm not talking about just simple little jobs. These jobs don't even exist. We don't know what the categories are. So this is a funny picture. Universities are really slow to adapt. They are so slow to adapt, it's unbelievable. They have problems adapting. Uh, we think that we were arguing whether or not this picture was from the 80s or the 70s. What did we finally decide, Kyle? Late 70s. Late 70s. You look at the hairdos and the funny little smiles and stuff. So <clears throat> It's just to make the point they're slow to adapt. So, so here's been the evolution of universities. Some of you have seen this before in the United States. The Greek academies, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, a range, range of others that got founded three, 400 years ago. Public colleges began to emerge, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Michigan, Virginia. Land grants got set up, Michigan State, Purdue, Iowa State, schools like that, MIT, Cornell. 
The American Research University evolves in the late uh, uh, 19th and early 20th century. Evolution, evolution, evolution. Some of you heard me talk about before, we think a new kind of university is being formed, a national service university, which is scalable, engageable, not sequestered on itself, not focused on itself. We think there's two prototypes now operating. One used to be a teacher's college located in uh, greater Phoenix, Arizona, called Arizona State University. And the second is Purdue University, one of the land grants that, which, is, which has now decided to scale, decided to move into a national service uh, modality. So 1988, 30 years ago, some pictures from Arizona, pictures around the world. How many of you know half of these? Oh, come on. OK, so who was above the fifth grade in 1988? Let's look at that. OK, so, so uh, Roseanne, Martin Luther King holiday issues in Arizona, uh, uh, the building of the library, Pref uh, President Nelson from ASU, uh, Rain Man movie, the uh, wrestling team winning the national championship in the 1980s, 1988 to be exact, 30 years ago exactly. The world looked different. Issues are being resolved in different ways. We went to the Rose Bowl in 87. State investment per student in ASU at the time, almost $10,000. Important number to note, almost $10,000. University had a small operating budget of $415 million in today's dollars, by the way. 14.2% four-year graduation rate. We're like, bad. <laughs> Some have argued that this was good. We, we should hearken back to the 1980s for the good old 80s. Resident undergraduate tuition, by the way, $2,500. Remember this number later. In 2017 dollars. At the time, seems cheap, but it really wasn't because nobody could afford that. How do we know that? Under 3% of the students attending the university came from Pell-eligible families in 1988. So looking back 30 years, what we had was a great foundation for a university that we were struggling to build. That was having some issues, figuring out how to operate, heavily dependent on the state, very much driven by a public investment model. It wasn't really drawing in the full breadth of talent from all of the families in Arizona, unless you believe, and maybe some of you do, that, that talent is determined by your parents' income. So we actually believe in the revolution. Nothing's determined by your parent anything, except how they raise you. Their social status does not determine your social status. Their social status is a starting point for you, not the ending point. And so higher education is a mechanism by which social mobility has been enhanced. 3% of the undergraduates coming in 1988 from Pell eligible families, bad. The state is Dramatically diverse. This is a highly diverse place. Less than 10% of the student body came from minority families in 1988 in the freshman class. So research, here's where we were. We were losing out to the fabulous research university, Mississippi State. <laughs> That's in Starkville, Mississippi. Oklahoma State, where I threw the javelin a couple times in Stillwater. New Mexico State in Las Cruces, and Hawaii, obviously, on one of those islands over there. And so these were the major research universities. We were just getting into this game. Wisconsin, UCLA, Washington, Texas, and Ohio State. So who's not heard of the ones on the right? Does everybody pretty much think that the ones on the right are like major research universities? Probably. So just remember this. Remember this is where we were. This is where we started. So now we're going to take a look at the present. And most of this talk is going to focus on the future. So this is where we are now. A few things going on. I love this picture here of the Earth taken by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Number 1, which is managed on this campus by a group of faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students, flipping that device in a way where they could take that shot of the Earth, this one right here. Uh, this uh, notion of our, of our projects with Adidas, the new uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, the downtown Phoenix campus. The, uh, again, back to wrestling championship. I'm an old wrestler, so anytime the wrestlers can win, it's really fantastic because wrestling's like really, really hard. And so the university is <laughs> the university is 
tremendously transformed in 30 years, but with technology only dramatically, dramatically affecting us for about the last five or six years in a dramatic way. Now we've changed some of our outcomes. Oh, this is a good outcome. I like this screen also. I'm gonna put this screen in my office. <laughs> With this picture. So all the university presidents and provosts and Mark Provost Searle and uh, admissions directors, is that who ranks this? Yeah, and so, and so you can see who we beat out. What this really means is really one thing that here in Arizona between 1988 and 2018, we were allowed to innovate and we did. We were focused on finding ways to be a different university and we found those ways. And people looking around in the rest of the country said, this could also be number one in the US for innovation or the craziest university that's ever been made. Now we're happy to do that so long as they keep those other ones up with us because otherwise it makes us look strange if it just says crazy. So this is some progress that we've made. Uh, I like the notion that we, uh, we, we dismantled our traditional anthropology department and with fantastic faculty leadership, we built a new school for uh, human evolution and social change. Uh, and then just this year, the National Science Foundation ranked it number one in the funding for research related to anthropology, ahead of those others that you see listed there. Uh, this one here, second in geological and earth sciences. You can see who we're beating, Stanford, MIT, Penn State, Michigan. This notion here in engineering, uh, better than, uh, or more research funding than Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Caltech, or Cornell. What this means, uh, this one here on 10th uh, year of production of Fulbright Student Awards, the award that goes to in the last 10 years, we beat Stanford, we beat Princeton, and we beat the University of Texas at Austin in producing Fulbright Scholarship Awards for our undergraduate graduates. These are, this is an unbelievable achievement, and it is nothing compared to where we can go. Nothing. We have the capacity and the design options and the capability and the advancing of this university to move in a way where we can, with this charter, as our driver, with this charter, this charter is now, I think, becoming a part of the foundational culture of the institution. Our institution is built on inclusion versus exclusion and the measured success of our students. It's built on research that's measured against the public benefit and it's built around the notion of did you or didn't you take responsibility for the outcome of your community. Now imagine a university with that charter, charter, with 3,600 faculty, with the beautiful place that we're located here, the fantastic campuses that we have, the fantastic facilities that we have, the way that our student leadership has evolved, the way that things are moving forward, the kinds of commitments that we have from our donors and from others that are helping us to move forward, the support that we get, we wish more from the legislature, we wish more for those of you that are here, uh, but nonetheless, we can make this happen. We can advance this charter at scale going forward, and I'll show you how that works. This is our operating budget now. It's mostly derived from our interaction for the delivery of our services in competition against others in an open market. That open market approach has allowed the university to become more innovative and more creative. That's our state investment per student. You remember the other number, 9,700. These are both in today's dollars. And so that investment number is below where we'd like it to be, but it's an investment number that we're happy to have received. And it's an investment number that gives you a sense that we're not running a, a, a public agency organization or a public welfare organization. We're running a public enterprise organization. Here's our graduation rate now, around 50% four-year graduation rate, which is an unbelievable achievement this is at the top of graduation rates for all universities that still admit B students. Only some research universities still do that. Most research universities have given up on the admission of B students. They stopped doing it. So we still do it. And so we show you the graduation rate here. 71% for A students, 46% four-year graduation rate for B students. 71% compares to the University of California's four-year graduation rate across all nine of its campuses, which is 62%. And the average four-year graduation rate for students with B averages coming into an American public college is around 15%. We're very happy with this kind of achievement. We're more happy with this five-year graduation rate. 75% of our students work. They don't necessarily have the complete and total freedom to complete their degrees in only a four-year time frame. That's our present undergraduate tuition. I'll give you a sense of what that really means. This is our net tuition. So this is after grants. I'll show you a chart about grants in a second. This has been, people have been picking on us a little bit relative to this. 
So we like to be picked on. It's really fun. But we really like to be picked on when people have the actual data to pick on us about. We like to argue about the data. So this chart shows you the following. If you're a kid from Arizona and an undergraduate attending this university, and you come from a family, by the way, the, the white line is the tuition cost. The white line is uh, the approximate tuition cost. If you're moving across this direction here, what we're basically showing you is that blue is financial aid from the university. Green is financial aid from the federal government. Uh, orange is uh, the average student payment. Uh, the uh, brighter orange is the uh, student financial aid. And so I guess actually yellow is the average, is the state financial aid, which is almost nothing. What this basically tells you is that all students from all groups and all classes are getting student financial aid from the university. This tells you to the left side of the chart, because of federal financial aid, many, many, many students are able to attend the university without a financial barrier. This tells you that the average, the average tuition for a uh, student, a average full-time resident student coming in is about $2,200, as I said in the previous slide. And what this means then, relative to our freshman class, this is the university today. This is the pre-technological university. This is the university just beginning to figure this out. Just take a look at green versus blue. So green was the freshman class by family income and size in 2002. Blue is the freshman class in 2017 by both income and size. There are no financial barriers to attend the institution. You may think there's a financial barrier. There are no financial barriers. We have a way to work it out through work study, through grants, through gifts, through financial aid, through packages, through the range of other things. And so we've been able to now actually create in the blue line for the first time the university actually being representative of the socioeconomic diversity of the state. 34.2% receive Pell Grants today. Students from Arizona, 40.8%. And that's within the range of the totality of Pell eligible students as a percentage in the state's population. That is a huge achievement for this institution. 50-50 diversity. 50-50 diversity. So research, OK, we're not on that right side anymore. We came over on this side. So no other university in the country has been able to do that. So this is the ranking of non-medical research expenditures. So we, we don't list on there because we don't want to embarrass them too much. We don't list that Stanford is below us, uh, UCLA is below us, USC is below us, Arizona is below us. <laughs> And the reason for saying that is that, I just want to go back, that diversity, that Pell eligibility, that freshman class, and that achievement are considered impossible. Now, an empowering force for us for that or the empowering forces for us for that were culture change and the fantastic adaptation of our faculty to an unbelievable group of individuals supported by our staff to be able to work in this environment, do those two things together, and their willingness to be creative with technology at every possible level. Unbelievable faculty. So. Twenty forty-eight. Again, we can't predict the future, but we thought this picture was good, pretty good. This is from a French magazine in the year 1900, estimating what things would look like in the year 2000. So apparently, if you look to the right side of the picture, you're going to grind books up <laughs> into some kind of thing, and you're going to send signals to those children over there now, this, is, this was drawn in 1900 about the prediction of the year 2000. And it is fundamentally not wrong. It's conceptually not wrong. It's just that grinding of the paper of the books is probably not the way that it would actually work. They, you'd have to come up with some other way. So now, I don't really like this woman in any possible way. And the reason in this next clip, is that there used to be an old way of teaching. 
teaching through skepticism, teaching through critique, teaching through offering bad outcomes, teaching through a certain sort of style. So let's, let's look for a second on the old way of teaching. Let's run that. Mutually assured destruction. Today, any nuclear country or terrorist is capable of inflicting damage on a massive scale with weapons of environmental entropy. The polar ice caps aren't waiting for us to decide if climate change is real. Rising coastal waters, intensifying weather patterns, they're all punching our one-way ticket to dystopia. By definition, not perfect. Huxley's Brave New World, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Orwell's 1984. Once considered fiction, these futuristic novels are actually happening right now, and they seem to be getting worse. Yes, Miss Newton. Can we fix it? Sorry? I get things are bad, but what are we doing to fix it? Have a good weekend, everybody. So, before I explain this next one to you, because some of you are going to have to guess what the next one is, that last one, on the old way of teaching, literally, present the problem, present the problem, present the problem, complain, complain, complain. I never liked that method of teaching. I hate that method of teaching. There's no solution in the method. There's no engagement of the newest thinkers that we have, the next generation of thinkers, the next generation of dreamers. You must engage them not in somehow being taught what we know, but being taught what we know and how to solve the issue and actually deriving the solutions themselves. Not later, now. Now that requires a complete reconceptualization of teaching. A complete reconceptualization of everything. Now let me confuse some of you. So, so these squares here are 20 light years by 20 light years across. So you can see this is a huge, 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 or seemingly huge, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 220 light years across place in our present galaxy. Some of you familiar with uh, uh, television and a whole series of things uh, associated with Star Trek will realize that there were some really bad people living over here called the Kardashians. <laughs> the Bajorians. And right here, little did I know until you sort of look at this map, so this is the Vulcan sector. So anybody remember Spock? How many have seen Spock in some form in your life, on television, in a commercial, in a movie, in a show? Who hasn't? Let's see your hands. I think it's like unbelievable. There's like one person back there. <laughs> David, is that you? Yes, it is David. So. So, so it turns out that the planet Vulcan is here, and their Earth space station is right over there. Earth is that star right there. This, our sun, Sol, is, is right there. So Vulcan, it's about 16 light years. Is that right, Kyle? 16 light years. And how fast can you get there at warp five? 27 days from Vulcan to Earth in warp five. So you may not know that we have images from the future. Oh, by the way, if you think 220 light years across this, and let's see, 20, 40, 60, 80 light, light years north and 220 light years across is a lot. It's 30,000 light years to the center of this galaxy. 30,000 light years to the center of this galaxy, just to give you some sense. And by the way, uh, I don't know if any people, anybody here from our school for Earth and space exploration? Yes, didn't we have a fantastic discovery announced in the New York Times this week by one of our faculty members, Judd Bowman? So Ariel, why don't you just shout out to everybody because it's really, I'm just, this is just a commercial. So when somebody decides to be able to do something where they use an experimental technique to, to prove something, so bring a, a microphone to Ariel. He didn't know I was going to call on him, too bad. So Judd Bowman is a young professor here in our School of Earth and Space Exploration. He's been theorizing about how early in the life of the universe could a star be formed. Now, how would you determine that? In the, since the universe is around 15 billion years old based on our present physical understanding. And so what did uh, Mr. Bowman and his colleagues discover? So he led a team that found the first starlight, the earliest starlight. The first starlight, the first star created was discovered. Absolutely. <laughs> the first star created. So this stuff, 
Oh, and that, by the way, that dude is like 15 billion light years away. Just to put that into perspective. So, well, we're going to go to, this, by the way, is one possible future. So now you're on Vulcan. This is a construction of a school. And I only dreamed I could go to a school like this. So you can meet young Spock at school. formula for the volume of a sphere. Four thirds pi times the radius cubed. 1.26 anywheres. What is the dimensionality? Dimensionality equals the logarithm of n divided by non excludability and non rival. Four thirds pi times the radius. And it is morally praiseworthy, but not morally obligatory. So Obviously, that's not the whole school. Somewhere they have to teach, you know, how to do mind melds and death grips and, you know, all, all the other things that Vulcans can do. And so the point of that, though, is this notion of this interface, a technological interface with a single learner as a part of their learning. So just keep that image in your mind, a technological interface with a single learner just with a part of their learning experience. Now, there's also futures that are not necessarily good. So this is a clip from a movie that's coming out at the end of this month. So this is all about virtual reality, which by the way, how many of you know that virtual reality is taking off like a jet engine? A few of you, like three of you. Okay, well, we'll all be dead soon anyway. So here's what, so, so, so here's what comes next. Another possibility, let's take a look at this. This is the oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay because of all the things they can be. So, well, they don't always work out so well though. So this happens to be downtown Columbus, Ohio at some point in the future. And so downtown Columbus, Ohio, at some point in the future, it, I don't know where Ohio State went. I don't know where Battelle. I, 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 don't, I don't know where Battelle is, you know, the Battelle Laboratories, all that cool stuff. And so basically what happened here is that, you know, you got to be careful. So I don't want anyone to leave the room thinking that we don't realize that you need to be careful about technology. You need to be very, very careful finding ways to enhance learning not to replace learning, finding ways to enhance reality, not to replace reality. If you replace reality, you get whatever this is. I'm going to go see the movie. I can't imagine that it has a, it probably has before there's a good outcome, a really bad outcome. So, so let's finish that clip. You'll see what happens. I'm here talking to all of you now because our future is being threatened. Yeah. Go, go, go. Yeah, so when I was in graduate school on uh, every week, where's Rick Shangra, he and I were in graduate school together, we would watch the Technology Run Amok movie series. So we were in a, in a, basically an academy producing thinkers about the future and designers of democratic institutions going in the future. That's the graduate school that we went to. And we literally would go to the Technology Run Amok movie series to see all of these horrible outcomes. And so I, I wanted you to know that there is a cautionary note on all advancement relative to all technology. So, what might a future student at ASU or anywhere expect? And here is where you're going to have to walk with this. So now this is 2048. Seamless, uninterrupted access to resources and experiences. Well, if they're all filtered by yourself and you've got no knowledge navigator, you've got no professors, you have no one that you're working with, you can have a good outcome or a bad outcome. We'd like to produce good outcomes. Transparent, crowd-verified information and, and accountability. Crowd-verified, somehow verified, it is true. We don't have that yet. We don't know true. We're getting confused about true. So we have to work on that. Freedom to personalize your interactions and your experiences. This is a build your own phone. Put your own technology into whatever you want. Component parts enable you to do whatever it is that you think you need to do. So the supercomputer that you're going to be carrying around in your pocket, which is beyond anything that you have ever seen, it's beyond the tinker toy that you're carrying now, which is just a tinker toy. What will it be able to do and how will it be able to assist you in learning? In 30 years, and we're going 30 years from those big walkie-talkie things that lady was wearing or on her head, whatever that was, 
to the things that we're going to have. It's not even, it's not even, we don't even have a sense of everything that we do. Unlimited access to crowdsourced expertise and artificial intelligence that provides personal guidance. Took her house down here. These are some of these uh, early generation Amazon Echo Dots that are in one of our residence halls helping some of our freshman engineers learn a little bit about interacting with some of these uh, voice-activated intelligent databases and so forth. Instantaneous and convenient access. Bring me a pizza now. You don't have to ask for it. You just have to look at it in a certain way or scan your retina or whatever. That would be really good. Immersive virtual environments that facilitate socialization, collaboration, and entertainment, the building of things together, the solving of problems together, the working on teams on a global basis. So how, do I, how would I solve this problem here? There's a group of American kids working with a, a group of kids in Africa, and they're working in some kind of way to link and to connect. You start accelerating the way that we're solving our problems, and you use all of these things as learning experiences. So now, the way that things work, unfortunately, education is considered around a rigid model of life stages. So we have one model for some people. They have, they're raised by their parents before kindergarten. They go K through K through 12. They might graduate. They might not graduate. That's bad. And then they go into their career, whatever that happens to be. Some people then do that, and then they go to technical school, and then they go into their career. And some people then go to uh, college, undergraduate, graduate sometimes, and then they go into their career. It's a linear process an old style process, an old style model, and I don't think that it's going to hold up. It's more likely that something like this is going to happen. This idea that, I don't know if Luke Tate is here or Jacqueline Smith, are either of them here? Jacqueline's here. So, so we have a team of people working on our idea of universal learner. So universal learner looks something like this. Pre-K learning, which is your absolutely most important cognitive, cognitive development phase of your life, with your parents, with your family, with some mechanism to bring you to some level of, of uh, learning awareness. I put K-12 in parentheses here. I don't know what it's going to be going future, but, but obviously it's got to be different from what we presently have or we're just going to get the same result. There's no amount of just yelling at the system. There's no amount of yelling at the system that will make it any better. It must be conceptually redesigned. Then from the time you leave with your whatever a high school diploma is going to be in the future, from that point forward, you become a lifelong learner. From that point forward, your lifelong learner activity is, is concentrated in this age frame. But here, if you take jobs and personal fulfillment and lifelong learning, and you make that then for the rest of your life, it's a completely different conceptualization of learning, a completely different conceptualization of life. And so it's the merging of the yellow and the red here and the bringing of those two things together. Now, no institution is ready for that. Nobody's ready for that. We're all structurally rigid, fixed. So universal learning at ASU, this is where we're headed. This is what we're trying to lay the foundation for. We're trying to be of service to all learners. That doesn't mean making the university some, a few years ago, somebody uh, said that ASU was interested in world domination. We're actually not interested in world domination. They, they had a picture of mine that they had doctored where they ground my teeth into little, little triangles and they had me you know, menacing. It was just it's kind of funny. My sister thought it was real. And so <laughs> how can we create a fully immersive learning environment filled with thousands of faculty and tens of thousands of students most of those students who are learners with us and workers with us, they're a part of everything that we're doing, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then at the same time, reach anyone who wants to learn. The welder who needs a new course. The person, sadly, I was talking with uh, Andy Tobin, speaker Andy Tobin, uh, just a little bit before the show. I mean, right now we have a pejorative term that we've, that we've developed in higher education to somehow make us feel some somewhat superior to other people. If you can't finish what we're doing, you know, we call you a dropout. Actually, those people are the ones that should call us failures. We failed the student. We didn't create an opportunity. And then we make it almost impossible for that person to go back and finish college. Oh, could you show me your transcript from when you were 18 years old and you were a big screw off? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You never get to recover. <laughs> really sorry. You can take a few classes at, you know, 
some night school somewhere. And so, so what we're interested in is changing this notion of what is universal learning. So the way we do this, we start with a knowledge core. That's us. That's the university of the faculty. We take everything that we've got, our departments, our schools, everything else. We then create a learning environment around that that we call full immersion. Full immersion pre-K where we're engaged with them. We're engaged with families. We're helping teachers. We're helping parents. We're doing everything that we can with every tool that we have, everything that we can bring. K through 12 learners and on-campus ASU learners, that's our full immersion environment. Our digital immersion environment, we, have an on, we now have an online uh, high school, we have an online post-secondary, we have distance learners, returning non-traditional learners, people that weren't able to finish college, people that weren't able to go to college, we have a way to connect to them from the university. Digitally immersive, massively open learners, this is on any scale. Do you want to plug into a course at ASU? Do you want to find some way? We've got a young woman here from Afghanistan who lived behind Taliban lines 18 months, 18 months ago. She found us in this blue zone. She took some of our courses, said, if I take courses or try to go to school here where I'm living in, in uh, Afghanistan, I'll be killed. Can I come to your university? She's a student at this university right now, here physically with us. And so exploration, uh, education through exploration, I picked on uh, Professor Anbar there earlier. This is everybody changing the whole learning process around game-based learning of very complicated subjects using interactive group and individual gaming as a way to enhance your learning. And then infinitely scalable, this is not the we want to dominate the world, it's that we don't want to leave anybody out if they want to be connected. We don't want to leave anybody out. So you take all this together, and this is, this is where we are now in 2018. This is going to intensify on every scale and every dimension and, every, and in every way. And we think that in our new model of a national service university, we can make this kind of model work. This next slide, I'm not going to go through this. These are all the things that we wish we had. We wish we had infinitely scale, scalable teaching. We wish we had tools, and we're working on a whole bunch of these, where Math and science mastery at a certain level could be made ubiquitously available to the entire population. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if we could pull that off, many, many, many things would change. This notion of uh, ubiquitous content delivery mechanisms, intelligent tutoring platforms, ways to connect humans in a tutoring modality with large numbers of students to be able to help everybody to be able to move ahead. This is where we're headed. So what are we doing? to service these uh, universal learners. We're working in all of these dimensions right now. We have our digital preparatory school. We have our expandable open scale offerings, ASU Online. We have our Global Freshman Academy, which has students that have signed up for a course and are engaged with us right now from 195 different countries around the world and some dudes that are hanging out in Antarctica. And that's not a country. So we have new technologies. These are things we're working on virtual reality technologies, and uh, Professor Anbar is here again. This, just imagine, so all this content is us and the Smart Sparrow uh, company from uh, Australia working together to create a new learning environment, a new way to learn by playing a game. So let's take a look at this video. This is under development now. Imagine this is a piece of your classroom. Not everything, a piece of what you're doing. You're with a group of students from all over. This is your learning environment. One of your learning environments. It must be something to do with the parachute surface area. We've checked air resistance, gravity, and the weight of the jumper. Students are crossing the top. I think the problem is here. Let's ping Rafael and Laura. Hey. Hey guys, we're still stuck on the landing. Here's a replay. Bad Red Bull scene. <laughs> so you learn by doing, but you don't want to go through that. Height was the sensor calibrated for Earth gravity or Mars? Oops. The future of education is here. No lectures, no laboratories, no limits. Learning by doing in a virtual universe where you explore your interests and the frontiers of human knowledge. Natural science, engineering, math, social science, humanities, everything that matters in the real world matters in PlanetWorks. It's education through exploration of the biggest unknown of all, 
our future. Our journey begins on Mars. This is our video, our project. The mission? Build a thriving society by learning and applying what you learn. What if you tried this? Yeah, let's try it. An immersive blended year where you will unlock your entrepreneurial spirit and design real-world planetary-scale solutions for our global society. PlanetWorks is full of learning experiences that are guided by an intelligent tutor, digital learning resources that adapt to individual students' needs. Imagine state-of-the-art visuals and designed learning environments that compel and intrigue the young minds of today. Imagine collaborative learning bridging countries and languages leading to better student outcome at scale. Imagine PlanetWorks. So this is not an example of replacement of anything. This is an example of augmentation. So how can a lifelong learner study this, master science, master problem solving, master working with a team while they're also getting their degree in English? while they're also studying music, while they're also producing a movie, while they're also writing poetry and doing all the other things that they can do. So what we're looking for are ways to augment learning. Now, this really quick video here, I'll just narrate this on the side. So biology is really hard to understand for some people. Chemistry is really hard for people to understand. So we have a lot of students who don't make it through college or don't do as well in college because they get scared off by certain things. And so this is a, another method to teach biology. How do you bring energy into a cell? These, uh, this is again from uh, one of the groups here at ASU. And so this notion is that you change the way that we learn so that three-dimensional thinkers don't have an advantage over those of, most of us are two-dimensional thinkers. Most of us can't get this stuff. And so I won't show you too much of this other than you can imagine that we now have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of ways to do this. Again, not to replace anything only to augment it so that you can intensify learning, so you can spread learning, so you can make, make learning happen. So the last phase here is a little bit about what's going on right now. So this is a book written in 1996 by Neil Stevenson called The Diamond Age, or his subtitle, A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer or Primer, depending on how you learn to pronounce that word, and that's The Young Lady. And so it's a, a system that was designed in this science fiction book in 1996. Now, this is a map of that system from the book that was drawn by a guy with the name Beat A. Schwindemann. So Beat put together uh, this notion of a book that connects to you. So think of your iPad. Think of a learning device. You're at the university. You're at college. You're at school. You're in kindergarten. You're learning in your life. You have a thing that's attached to you. It's your learner. It's your learning assistant. So what we have is a group of students. A bunch of them are over here. How many of you guys are from Luminosity? Just stand up. So we have a group of students. They're not all here, but this is a bunch of them right here who are taking this. Yeah. They're taking this learning, this, uh, learning system that was conceptualized in a science fiction novel, and they're doing everything that they can to construct it. Now, the idea is that with a device like this, all learning becomes empowered so that all the basic learning can be handled through these kinds of systems. And then everything else you want to do in learning in your life moving forward can then be on top of that. So let's just take a look at how our group is doing. The Axio platform is, I think, uh, a platform meant for the individual and their, their personalized growth and their learning. This platform is somewhere someone goes to advance themselves and that you know, through that it's facilitated by this AI companion. It has the ability just to talk to you. We truly believe this can be the first project that facilitates this lifelong learning among everybody, no matter 
what part of your life you're in, no matter your age, no matter your demographic. You can think of, of it as a, as a Wikipedia of digital learning, which anybody from anywhere could use. They could contribute, curate, and advance the repository of data, of the knowledge base that we have. Whenever I'm doing anything with Axio, with the visuals, if it looks cool, if it doesn't look cool, I always have to stop and say, is this on purpose for us? Is this driving the point that Axio is a friendly AI companion and that it's here to drive value into your life? Hello, Cece. How are you doing today? I'm doing well today, Axio. Is there anything I can do to help you? I've been thinking about traveling lately. How exciting. Let's see. Where are you thinking of going? I'm thinking about going to Italy. There's some art I want to see. You can think of it as a guide which is not paid, which is with you all the time and which sees what you are studying and what you want to study. You can set your goals into it. It will be surrounding you. It will be around you. At the same time, it's not gonna uh, intrude into your privacy. I think it should be a friend for life. I think people should feel like this companion knows them. It remembers the thing that's important to them. It remembers good memories, and it can identify when you're trying to express an emotion. You know, a best friend always has your back. He or she always is looking out for your best interests, and that's kind of what Axios is. It's, it's always looking out for your best interests, no matter what age you are. It doesn't see color, race, wealth. It does not matter. It, the, its only task is what's best for you. I think this is such a great tool to help um, discover themselves and discover things they might not realize that um, something that AI and newer technologies can really tap into and uh, help them along. It helps the new kid getting out of college. It helps the kid just starting life. It helps the old person that's trying to keep in touch with their family. It helps the person that doesn't feel like a lot of people talk to them. You know, it's, it's a companion. It's a friend. And that, that's important to people. You know, we keep relationships for a reason. I think that if I had a tool like Axio that would help me see resources that I might not have seen before or give me access to information about you know, different schools or different um, jobs that I could apply for, I think that that would be something that would be really helpful and that I would use personally. The idea behind Axio is that people have access to all the information they need to truly succeed in whatever aspect they want to dive into in their life. Innovation, you know, evolves throughout generations, and I think that this has the potential to be such a, a pivotal like, piece in young people's lives. So that's an active project that's underway right now, self-funded within the institution by a group of students that are working on it. The point is that we are now a fundamentally transformed institution committed to the notion of inclusion versus exclusion and the success of our students by every means possible, by every human tool that can be devised, by every assistant that can be devised, by every way to augment a teacher or a professor that can be devised, and then connecting all of that going forward in the next uh, few decades as a fundamental part. This is a fundamental departure from a university construct. Universities were places that you went to and sat with the faculty to learn from them and show and develop your own uh, personal intelligence. And that's fine, but that's insufficient. That's insufficient. So we are constructing for this ASU of the future going forward to 2048, an institution that will be built around this integration of great students, great faculty, great learners, great team builders, great team uh, members making all these, these, these things happen. And uh, for us, uh, we are uh, immensely excited about what uh, lies ahead. So. That's it. <laughs>
uh, 70 years of experience and achievement. We see that as something very important for Arizona, very important for Phoenix, very important for ASU. So we're uh, going to be building a new uh, facility for them, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, downtown uh, Phoenix uh, campus. We're going to be expanding our executive education programs, our degree programs, our online programs, our global management programs, reaching out uh, on a global scale. So we see this as an important uh, continuation of the evolution of ASU. What do you anticipate ASU's financial model to be going forward? ASU's financial model should be a really simple one. We have not been yet successful at, and I didn't know these questions, so, so uh, uh, what we're looking for is the following. We want the investment of the, of the state through the state legislature in the university to not be an investment to the university. We don't want any investment for the university unless we come in and make a special request. What we want to the university from the state legislature is an investment in only the kids from Arizona that come to the university. That's all we want. We want half of their cost of their education. So their education, roughly fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars, is what it costs us for that education. Tuition is ten. We we buy that tuition down with financial aid. We're not getting but a but a third of that from the state. We'd like to get a half of that from the state, and then on a day in and day out basis, we're done. We don't need anything else. We can make the rest of the institution work out operating in the knowledge market, out operating in the research market, out operating in the international uh, student market and the, and the interstate student market. And then every once in a while, back to that Star Trek chart, if you really want to get all the cool stuff and to be the leader in research, every once in a while we'd like two miles of freeway. Here's how it works. For, two mi for the cost of two miles of freeway, we can build what we call Star Trek type research buildings. That's all we need. And then we put the brainiacs in these Star Trek type research buildings. And then out of that comes everything that you can possibly imagine. And we now have the capacity with tens of thousands of people, including our students, working in that research enterprise. So the financial model going forward is we want support for the kids from Arizona, the students from Arizona. We want an occasional every 10 years or so an infusion of research facilities, call it freeway, two miles of freeway here and there. And then uh, what we want after that is uh, to be uh, held accountable for what we do, to be driven towards a certain set of goals, and then to be left alone so that we can get this thing done. So, yes. <laughs> the next question is from Frank Gallardo. How is ASU engaged today to address the wave of older adults Arizona will have in 2050? Yeah, well, we got a lot of them now. <laughs> 2050, man. <laughs> so between now and then, what I hope to do is to, is to be a part of a team at ASU capable of building these learning platforms that we're talking about, where it doesn't make any difference how old you are. You'll be able to learn at any speed, any rate, any set of subjects, any set of new subjects, any topic, anywhere, anytime, anything that you want. Concentrated in particular right here in Arizona around the people that are around us. So one thing we're doing. Uh, and some of you have even bought some. We're, we're building the uh, unbelievable dormitory for old people right now. <laughs> and so in this facility that's under construction as, as we speak called Mirabella, uh, a few hundred families will uh, move in there, uh, couples, uh, will move in there and they will become engaged with the university, uh, hopefully. They will become engaged with learning, hopefully. They'll partake of everything, be connected hopefully become mentors, they become uh, learners, master learners, they're teaching classes, having lectures, doing this, doing that, part, you know, in a sense, parting with their own uh, hard-fought, well-found knowledge. And then in addition to that, they'll be ubiquitously enveloped in our teaching, learning, and discovery environment, including all of the technological aspects of that environment. So by 2050, 2050, I think the whole world will be different. I think that uh, uh, if a person's mind is working, person's mind is working, there's no reason that so long as their, their mind is working that they can't make whatever the last year was, the year they learned the most. The year that they understood the most, absolutely. That's weak applause for that idea, but, <laughs> oh yeah. I know some of you say that, you know, by, by the time I'm, you know, 85, I just want to have, you know, like, uh, be able to go over to McDonald's with my uh, socks on and my uh, <laughs> sweat clothes and sit around and talk to the, to the workers there uh, over my egg McMuffin. So, 
the next That's where question I was this morning. So. From Suzanne Reddy. What is ASU doing to help students who aren't sure what to major in? So majors are, uh, it's all this tension around majors. So, so we have, what we decided to do is offer like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of majors. And we did that because we know everybody learns in a different way. And then we said, pick one that makes you smile, that makes you happy, that makes you excited, that makes you want to get up and get out of bed every single day and get at it. We will make certain that every one of those majors produces a learning opportunity for you that makes you and empowers you to be a master learner. So if your major is in accounting or English or opera or philosophy or engineering or sustainability or whatever the major happens to be, that's going to be a pathway for you to become a, and so in a sense, what, what I say to students is the following. Don't worry about it. If you can't decide, major in English or history. You'll be fine. Everybody looks at me like, oh man, my father won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> and I said, eh, he'll get over it. So. <laughs> the next question is from an online viewer. What would you like to be doing personally in 30 years from now? 30 years from now, I'll be 92 years old. I'd like to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> or frozen. Because someday those Star Trek research labs are going to come back and say, well, you know, the ones that were frozen this way, no chance. The, the ones that were frozen kind of this way, uh, I don't know. But these guys over here, frozen that way, we can get them back on. So <laughs> I just want to be in that tank over there. <laughs> the next question is from Chip Wilson. Do you have any plans on future expansion of Wilson, Williams Gateway? And if so, if when, what? So Williams Gateway is a you know, huge old Air Force base, now big multi-tenant uh, facility uh, given by the, uh, it was a part of the base closure commission in the mid-1990s, was given back to the people of Arizona to produce a commercial airport, to produce a campus for economic development and educational opportunity. We got a few hundred of those acres. So our plans for what we now call the Polytechnic Campus is uh, uh, build, 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 the capability to engage new learners. Build, build, build the capability to uh, create new ways of learning, to grow that to a 15,000 student uh, physical full immersion campus, to have programs emanating from that campus. You know, we train pilots there in our programs. We train human factor engineers. We train manufacturing engineers. We train, train scientists, biologists, teachers, everything from that campus right now. So we're looking for that to become an active, full-throated, um, fully engaged uh, 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 place for uh, uh, unique learning. Where is ASU headed in terms of demonstrating health and healthcare leadership? Yeah, well, oh, so here's the situation you all know. We, have this, we live in a really, really, really strange place when it comes to health. So we spend the most, almost $10,000 per person per year for healthcare. And of the 30 leading industrialized countries, we're around 26th or 25th or something like that in outcomes. So countries that spend half of what we spend have higher outcomes. Outcome is lifespan, health span, healthy life across the population. How is it that we have a declining lifespan in the United States? Well, we have an opioid epidemic that's unbelievable. If you're a Woman of European descent with only a high school education, your lifespan is deteriorating on average at the rate of an untreated AIDS epidemic across the entire population right now. And so what we have and what we're working on is we're trying to reconceptualize everything that we're doing. We created a new college of health solutions. We just hired a fabulous new dean coming in to help us on the sort of social scale and the social design of that college. We're focused on solutions, solutions, solutions. Rather than just training health professionals, we're trying to train health professionals through the process of deriving solutions. And so we're working computationally. We're working uh, uh, in uh, technical disciplines, social disciplines. We're integrating between technical and social. We're trying to figure out how to enhance health outcomes and life uh, extension and healthy life outcomes uh, by every tool imaginable. And that means figuring out how to deal with and how to address very significant social inequities that we have in the delivery of, uh, of health care. As certain elements of health care have become overly expensive, you might have heard, by the way, there's been some debates about health care recently. 
this, what I'm talking about isn't about the debates. What I'm talking about is what are the solutions that somehow someone has to figure out how to finance. We don't even have the right solutions, the right tools, the right techniques, the right mechanisms to be able to advance in the way that we should, much less the right financial mechanisms. So we're working on all of those things. What do you think the future will hold for community colleges? So again, in this model of lifelong learning, community colleges are a fantastic set of institutions for people who uh, want to take a shorter period of time uh, early in their life after high school, uh, uh, get some training in a certain subject, maybe go to work right away, maybe be working while you're going to college, working full time while you're going to college. And so, so what we're looking for with community colleges is to enhance our ability to innovate with them together to produce more graduates. We have more people coming to ASU from the community colleges now than ever. We have more people graduating from the community colleges that come to ASU than ever. We're even working on a big, super secret, big announcement. Uh, uh, the provost is laughing and looking down at the floor. And so, uh, and, and so we're looking to find new ways to educate, new ways to stimulate education, working with our community college partners, uh, driving down costs, driving up outcomes, making these things work. And so that's what, that's what we're working on relative to the community colleges. This question is from Mark S. Where do you look for your inspiration and new ideas? Mark S. The name of the provost is Mark Searle. <laughs> really, Mark? You know, <laughs> you and I talk every day. <laughs> every single day. Voice to voice, email, innumerable interactions in every form of communication imaginable. He has to ask me this, you know. So, so we get innovations and ideas from innovations from everywhere, including Star Trek movies, including new technologies that the private sector is developing. We have 170 or so private sector technology partners embedded into our learning platforms, embedded into our learning tools. We're trying to hire people and bring them in. And, and uh, uh, we've got a lot going on in Silicon Valley. We've got a lot of partners in Silicon Valley. In fact, the big rumor up in uh, Silicon Valley right now that's kind of funny, in fact, is that uh, ASU is the public university that Silicon Valley couldn't produce. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and so, it's so, so, so how did they become the ones that are so innovative? Well, I don't know. You know, it's the, 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 the water in Arizona or something. And so, and so uh, we look for innovations everywhere. We're now offering a nuclear engineering degree, right, Mark, uh, through University of New South Wales here. So we've got a great engineering school, but we don't want to ten, take 10 years to build nuclear engineering as a degree. So now we're offering that degree. We have a new degree that we're offering. This goes to the notion of how, how we innovate and who we work with. We have a new degree in international public health that we're offering with King's College London and the University of New South Wales uh, that's really doing really well so far in its first launch. We have seven students. And so that is funny. And so, uh, and so what I mean by that is that we, we get innovations from everywhere. Every interaction, every team, everyone we work with. Uh, we've now got uh, uh, significant amounts of uh, private philanthropy funding innovations for us right now. We've got, uh, we have a tool called Me3, funded by a local philanthropist that we built that if you take this little 60 question visual test, it will then by the end of the test, it will say to you, well, I think, it'll say, well, Michael, I think that you are interested in this as a career. And if you are, here's the degree programs that you might look at at Arizona State University. And here's the math intensity you need to think about for your high school education. And here's what you need to think about to get yourself ready. And here's what you need to do. And here's the pathway to a career and so forth and so on. So of most people that have taken this, even as adults, including myself, it is an unbelievable tool. So there was a, we had uh, something at our house a few weeks ago. And someone was over there. And there was a young woman that was over there who, uh, was really struggling in high school, and she didn't know what she wanted to do. And I said, well, I'll come back to my office. So I took her back. I said, I'll come back in a few minutes. Just take this test. So she took the test. When I came back to my desk where she was working, she was crying. She said, well, I don't know how it did this. It said that I wanted to be uh, a theater major and a master on the track that we have in costume design and costume development. That's what it said for her. She said, how did it know that? I said, well, I can't really answer that. But I know that it's really accurate often. And so she didn't realize that she had this dream that could actually be realized by possibly going to college. Now, I took the test. 
And it said I should be a talent scout, which I kind of am, or a movie producer. <laughs> and my wife, who's sitting over here, Sybil, she knows that I've told her several times, if I didn't have this job, I told her this long before I took the test, I wanted to be a movie producer. Now, isn't that, isn't that the weirdest thing imaginable? <laughs> so that program is now an innovation that we did with others, with partners, in English, we just deployed it in Arabic, working with a set of individuals who are interested in getting more people trained in the Arabic-speaking world as rapidly as possible so that economic development might exceed certain other kinds of occasional negative outcomes occurring in parts of the world where economic development is not so positive. So. If, you just, if everything that you describe for the future comes to pass, what would it mean for state and national competitiveness? Well, so we have about a $20 trillion economy in the United States right now, give or take. Uh, One-fifth of the global economy, around $100 trillion. For eons and eons and eons and eons, the economy of the planet was like nothing. Nothing. The economy of the United States has increased by a factor of six since 1960. And so, the impact of the empowerment of people through higher and higher levels of educational attainment, and I don't mean getting degrees only. I mean by being able to be educated across your lifetime, being able to adjust to everything that you encounter. Oh, they say that all the Uber drivers are going to be driven out of work by all these uh, Volvo XC90s that are driving around Tempe and Phoenix and all over the place, and they're not going to have any work. Well, that's not true. They're going to have, Vol they're going to have Uber fleet commanders and uh, Coors truck uh, uh, delivery commanders managing 10, 15, and 20 trucks, making $200,000 a year, managing computer interfaces and supply chain logistics for all these things. They're going to have coders and programmers and designers and so forth and so on. And then they're going to have advertisers and creators and whole new ways of thinking. And then obviously they need a lot more lawyers and things like that because we're going to still be arguing. <laughs> and so the point is that the economy that we think of right now, if somehow in the next 50 years, we don't facilitate further economic development that empowers things to eliminate uh, huge income disparities. You do that not by government policy. You do that by building economic opportunity, by building economic opportunity through educational attainment, through access to educational outcomes. So what I'm looking for is the first time we were able to say to anybody, no, you're not relocated to a back-breaking physical job in which your body is going to be sacrificed for some minimum wage to allow you somehow as a function of that to be able to feed your family and not very well. How about freeing people to the extent that we can to be able to be as maximally creative and dynamically engaged in the creation of an expanded economy as we possibly can? And I think that's where we're headed. I think that means good and fantastic things as possible outcomes for uh, not just us in the United States, but for uh, uh, the rest of the world also. Maybe Could like two more questions. I have one more question. One more question. So this question is from Zai Zong. How can researchers on campus go beyond their individual projects to advance ASU's culture of research collaboration and success? How can they what? The beginning part? How can researchers on campus go beyond their individual projects? Oh. How can researchers on campus go beyond their individual projects? And so, well, lots of ways. So if you're working on a tiny, narrow area of research, one way to go beyond your tiny, narrow area of research is to make sure that you're educating many, many other people about what you're doing all the time. That's a really important thing, including kids, particularly young, young students that are coming along. Secondly, there's almost no area of research which exists in isolation. So the fact that ASU-based astronomers have, uh, or astrophysicists have now uh, determined the origin point and time of the first star after the Big Bang. What does that mean? Well, there are lots of implications of that, not just for science, but for our understanding of the universe, our understanding of time, our understanding of distance. There's huge opportunities to collaborate with others. There's philosophical questions. There's religious questions. There's a range of other issues that come up from this. And so there's no shortage of opportunity to work with others. And so we work to facilitate this significant engagement. Think of it this way, maybe as my closing comment. 3,600 faculty that hopefully we've picked from the best all together here where we've broken down barriers where they can work together, surrounded by 75,000 students who are here with us on campus, surrounded by ultimately tens of thousands of others who are learning with us to pursue degrees, 
more broadly, surrounded by hundreds of thousands of learners, all of that working back and forth together to produce better ideas, better outcomes, and so forth. So the only people that will live in isolation, you know, the, the sealed room with the tinfoil over the door and the pizza underneath the door, we have some people that are like that. And usually, we give them pizza. And that's fine. That's fine. So long as they're still teaching and creating a learning environment and being creative in their research and so forth, that's fine. But what we also need is an opportunity for everybody, if they want to collaborate and to work together, and we think that we've built that, to be able to do that. So thank you, Brittany, and thank you to all of you for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.